Impressions. This is Ali Nessa coming to you from the beautiful Venice Beach, California, and I'm joined today by Dr. Shervin Golian. Uh, Dr. Golian, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Dr. Golian is an uh, excellent endodontist practicing in San Luis Obispo here in California, and uh, he's joined me because I uh, I know you, Shervin, now for, what, 15 years or so? Yeah. Uh, 10, 15 years, Shervin went to the endo program at Harvard, and uh, I had seen some of your cases, beautiful cases, using the CBCT technology, using the Merida CT online, and uh, also recently I understand that you started using the bioceramic sealer for your obturation technique, and I asked uh, uh, Shervin to put together a couple of cases that he had recently done as I was visiting here, family uh, vacation uh, in Los Angeles, and uh, met up with me. And here in Muscle Beach, uh, California, right. right? It's a great place to share uh, some cases. And um, Shervin, why don't you uh, go ahead and talk about a couple of these cases that you had done uh, so we can share them with the audience and talk about them as we went forward. The first case you have here is a mandibular right first molar who went to see you with a chief complaint. Yeah, the chief complaint was uh, basically chewing pain and there was some buccal swelling adjacent to this tooth. and. The general dentist referred this case to me because uh, they really didn't know what to expect with uh, the internal resorption that they saw on the x-ray and they pretty much gave it, it a poor prognosis. So, you know, typically what we would do is take our PAs and we take some angled PAs in order to take a look at this internal resorptive defect and see how much tooth structure is left. And when we take our angled PAs, it doesn't look too good. It, it looks like it may be perforating towards the distal of that distal root. Um, we definitely see, see an abscess in this tooth. Um, and the crown was recently placed by the general dentist. It, it doesn't look like it, it's completely sound on the x-rays, but when we look clinically, we see that there's no caries. Uh, all the margins were sealed, so uh, this crown was placed actually on a tooth with this situation going on. So, so I think if uh, well, the first lesson to learn here is that it's always before you place a crown, it's a good idea to take a fresh radiograph, uh, a periapical and a bite wing to find out what's the status and also do some pulp testing to find out what's the status of the tooth before you get started. So Sherwin, how did you, uh, first of all, decide that this is uh, internal versus external resorption? Because that's a question that always comes up. Well, the, 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 the main thing with, with just doing PAs is you want to take those angled x-rays. You, you want to use the slob rule, same side lingual, opposite side buccal. Um, you want to see if uh, that internal resorption actually moves. Um, in this case, it still stayed in the center of the tooth, so we're, it's in the center of the root, actually. So we know that, that it's internal. We're, we do our perio probing to see if we get any, any drops down into the the bone area and we don't, the periodontal probings are all normal. So, you know, at this point with radiographs, the what we do is we assume, we surmise, and we guess as to what's been going on. And this is where cone beam ha has really become a game changer, where we don't need to guess anymore because we can actually see in three dimensions what's happening inside the tooth. Right, because the, the real question here is, is this um, um, internal resorptive defect perforating or not? And that's not an information that you can gain from a two-dimensional radiograph, that's where the CT comes handy. And I think you, what you did next here, uh, Shervin, is you exposed a, a CT radiograph here and took some axial sections. So you can walk us through this uh, next slide here. Yeah, and th this is really where the, the cone beam comes in handy. And, and honestly, the endodontists that are using cone beams in their offices, they, we all really have this idea that it's helpful in every single case. And in this case, it's not only helpful to tell us where the resorptive lesion is located, but the actual root anatomy, because we know a lot of roots are kidney-shaped, and if this distal root was a kidney shape, then it would, it would be hiding the, the perforation because you wouldn't really be able to see it as the, the actual PA x-ray would be taken. So in this case, we can see that there is some bone loss towards the distal. There's some tooth loss towards the distal, but there's enough tooth structure there that I felt confident that we could go in using the microscope to actually remove that defect internally, disinfect it, and actually obturate the whole system and get a good result. 
Yeah, of course. And I think it's also helpful to know, looking at the axial section, that, for example, in one aspect of the tooth and towards the distal, you're having a thinner portion, I mean, the, the, the dentin is thinner. So in terms of size uh, choices and for sizes of the of files that you're going to use, as well as which direction you're going to push more, you, it gives you a little bit of a sense of understanding yeah. as to what you need to and do. And the other thing is the buccal lingual aspect of this, it really shows you that it's not perforating or moving in that direction. It's really just a, a mesia distal aspect that you need to be able to clean in this situation. So it also guides you. So I see here in the next x-ray that you uh, did access and this is your working length determination. Yeah, this is our working length determination. And you can see the canal's been opened up pretty wide. And really the microscope is the key thing here. We use a Pro Ergo Carl Zeiss microscope. The xenon bulb really shows us the internal aspects, the different colors that you see with uh, xenon light and magnification, that illumination really helps you determine what's inside there. Of course, we use instruments to make sure we have solid dentin once we've cleared all that resorptive defect. And once we've gotten past that, the rest of it is just doing the, the root canal properly. And what do you use also for your apex location? What apex locator do you use? Um, I use the J. Merida apex locator. We don't just solely rely on apex locators, but the radiographs as well to make sure we do the, a good job. Yeah, I think apex locators are indispensable tools. What I always say is that the radiographs don't just tell you what size, uh, how long your roots should be, but also give you a sense of what size uh, master apical file you should use because of the anatomy that you end up having at the apex as well as the dimension of the root. So uh, here it looks like you have uh, set your length and you proceed to instrument um, and now you're fitting your cones here? Yeah, I'm fitting my cones here. So the instrumentation was done with uh, my favorite file system, which is the, uh, the sequence file system that Brassler uh, mm -hmm. has manufactured. I've been using it ever since you introduced it to me mm -hmm. about uh, over 10 years ago. Yeah. So. It's, uh, it's worked out beautifully and we're able to clean with confidence and these are the actual BC sealer cones that are in there. Um, we get nice tug back down to the working length and at this point we can see where our voids are and where we need to... to you rely on the bioceramic to fill in as your filler. Exactly. And I can see here on the next x-ray here you finished the case, it looks beautiful. Can you tell us a little bit about the obturation experience and what you ended up doing? Yeah, with the obturation experience, I mean, the, the bioceramic sealer, uh, again, it's, it's something that is so beautiful to see under a microscope because the microscope really shows you how well the sealer actually adapts to the walls. I mean, I could see it filling in the resorptive lesion, um, the, the canals itself. So when I put the cone in, at, at the time of placing the cone, I, can, I know that all the walls are coated. I can actually see that the sealer is interacting and interfacing with the dentin. We place the cones in there and we, uh, we seal it off. On the, on the distal canal there, I, I needed a little bit more retention for the buildup and the crown. Typically I would place a post, but I was worried that a large post like this would end up fracturing the tooth. So we just used the uh, composite buildup material and actually bonded it inside the, the distal root to get the retention. And in this aspect, we we're able to build the tooth back up and seal that resorptive lesion at the same time. So you, you access through the crown and then fill the access at the same time as well. Right. And you bond it inside. So how, what was your protocol for cleaning the, uh, um, the, the post preparation area where you bonded the composite? You basically did a composite post. What was your protocol for cleaning that space from the biceramic sealer? Well, basically we used a, like a, a heat source. You could use the touch and heat, a system B to remove the coronal portion and then we use pluggers to pack in the material and once I did that a small alcohol pellet uh, rinse with water and uh, using the Stropco air syringe to actually air dry the the tooth before we start the bonding process so it's a really yeah. beautiful clean so it's clean before yeah obviously we want to have all the biceramic sealer out of there before uh, bonding to it. One of the things that I all, always use is also using ultrasonics and water to just very quickly get rid of the bioceramic. Uh, and then roughing out the surface using maybe a diamond coated um, um, instrument uh, or something like that is not a bad idea either because then you can actually etch it again with phosphoric acid and then place your bond um, bonding agent and uh, get a fairly good bond to that uh, structure. 
So this is great. Uh, it's a wonderful case. You've uh, handled it very nicely. I can see that you have uh, optured and you've been following it up. Now, these cases that you're sharing with us, you've recently uh, converted to using the biceramic. So yeah. uh, there's not much recall yet, but you have had so far. How's, how's been the post-op uh, um, in terms of uh, these patients? The post-op has been pretty dramatically different than any other sealer I've used. It really had no post-op sensitivity. Uh, the patients seem to be doing fine immediately after treatment. So it's been very good. And I, I think all the aspects that you talk about, about the sealer being mm. uh, biocompatible and not causing post-op sensitivity so far have been true and it's worked out really well. Terrific, that's great. So why don't we take a quick break and come back for, the, uh, for, for another case? Sure.